Welcome to the opening event for the library's current exhibition, Meeting Christ in Faith and Art. Our program this evening is the Catholic University and Theological Aesthetics. I'm Christine Brancolini, Dean of the Library, and it's a pleasure to see such a large and eclectic crowd this evening. It's really great to see students, faculty, staff, parents, the community, all together for a wonderful program to come. The exhibition that uh, is the subject of this program spans the third floor atrium and the Archives and Special Collections Gallery just outside the door. If you have not yet had a chance to explore the exhibition, I hope that you will do so this evening. The gallery, which usually closes at 5, will be open again after this program until 7.30. In addition to artwork and works from archives, student artwork rather, and artworks from archives and special collections, we have some special pieces on display in the classroom that is adjacent to the Archives and Special Collections Gallery. So I hope you'll stop by there too. Tonight's program and reception celebrate the latest in a series of exhibitions that feature partnership between LMU faculty and librarians at the William H. Hannon Library. Our faculty partner for this exhibition is Cecilia gonzalez Andreu, Associate Professor in the Department of Theological Studies. Dr. gonzalez Andreu is an alumna of Loyola Marymount University. She received her PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where she was the first to combine the study of systematic theology with religion and the arts. She is one of the leading scholars of theological aesthetics and author of the book, Bridge to Wonder, Art as a Gospel of Beauty, which we highlighted in our Faculty Pub Night Series speaker, in our Faculty Pub Night speaker series last year. Her book has received international acclaim and praise for its ability to, quote, link art's power to move beyond the discursive, cognitive, and propositional to a theology grounded in an experience that opens the imagination and moves one to encounter God in all things." Unquote. Next, Dr. gonzalez Andrew will tell you about the exhibition and introduce our student speakers. So please join me in welcoming me to the podium, Dr. Gonzales, Cecilia gonzalez Andrew. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Dean Brancolini. You know how much I love being in this space and working with your amazing library. Um, and you have the best team ever, so I want to thank them. Um, they made this possible, along, of course, with my amazingly wonderful students. Um, but our leader, Cynthia Beck, and the creativity and professionalism of John Jackson, Jessica Guardado, and Carol Raby. And I also need to thank the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination for their support of this opening program, which really, really for me is to celebrate our students. And thank you to Brian Trenner and to Kat Lash Brown. I'm also really grateful to Joe Wakeley Lynch and to John Rao of LMU Magazine, who featured the work of our very gifted Ralph here at Paddock Sill, who did this beautiful art. And um, Thank you also for the support of this kind of beautiful living experiment that I do um, of theological aesthetics to my Department of Theological Studies, the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, and the University's Office for Mission and Ministry. And most of all, I want to really thank the parents, the grandparents, the siblings, and the friends of our student artists. You know, I, I really remember so many times when we would be having conversations, talking through what the plan was for their art piece, and they would start remembering things from their childhood or relationships in their families, um, the, the memories, the questions. So you are really represented in their work, and uh, you, you should be very proud of these young people. And then, um, of course, I, I really want to uh, invite us to celebrate and thank two really important people. These, without them, a course like mine doesn't happen. 
Um, the first is, of course, our own uh, Father Thomas Rausch of the Society of Jesus. And this is one of our most important texts that we read in the course. See all the students going. <laughs> um, and it, it, Father Rausch, his Christology is, is the way that we enter deeply into this conversation. And you'll be hearing a little bit more from him in a little bit. And then, of course, also with us, oh, Father Rush, where are you? <laughs> right back there. <laughs> and then, uh, where is John? Is John here? I know he was out there. <laughs> and he's probably still out there. <laughs> So, of course, uh, John August Swanson, whose work we studied, and for our students, it's so amazing to have an artist whose works hang at the Vatican Museum and at the Tate Gallery and at the Smithsonian, come and share with them and, and really have a relationship with these young people as we pass along this beautiful craft. So, um, and then I also want to thank these beautiful people, and I'm crazy about them, if you can't tell. Uh, the, um, the works that we have span the last three semesters, but there's a couple of works that actually go back uh, to about 10 years ago when uh, I began teaching this course. And the course has changed lots throughout the years, but the amazingly wonderful students continue to come and continue to give of themselves. So you guys like the picture? <laughs> um, and then, I, of course, I want to thank my graduate assistant, Emily. <laughs> I will be hearing from her again, too. But Emily began, you know, as a, as a graduate assistant in, in, in our department, and then throughout our work together, became a very adept assistant teacher for this course and really developed a wonderful relationship with the student community and helped us to do a course which is very complicated and it would be hard to do without her. She is graduating in May with her master's in theology and she just found out she got accepted to her dream PhD program. And so she will be So, meeting Christ in faith and art. The exhibition you will tour this evening and the gifted undergraduate students you will meet provide the very best embodiment and articulation of what our esteemed library and the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination have asked me to present to you. A very, very brief look into what the work of theological aesthetics is and why it is central at a Catholic university. Now this may be the first time you hear this term, theological aesthetics, but I can guarantee you that after your tour, tonight's exhibition, you will have had experiences, those experiences that it describes. So to set some contours, in theological aesthetics we're always dealing with embodiment, which means that we're paying great attention to what is around us through our senses and through the movements of our heart. Even when our world is full of pain and uncertainty, as we very much feel it is today, or maybe even more urgently, when our world feels chaotic and difficult, a theological aesthetic sensibility can bring us to a renewed wakefulness about our place in the world and about our deepest questions. And so my remarks are going to be brief because I want each of you to have some wonder-making experiences tonight. And I want the theory to be mediated to you through these gifted young people because it's been really a privilege to teach them. Three of them are going to join me up here in a little bit to address you. And the rest of the class members who are wearing their pins <laughs> that say wonder makers <laughs> uh, will be hosting you in the exhibit spaces to speak about their art making and to answer any questions that you have. So, theological aesthetics functions as a particular embodiment of the priorities of a university in the Catholic tradition because it is about 
forming relationships within and between communities. It's about the sustained search for truth, and it's about the promotion and the construction of goodness. So let me exemplify some of these key principles through the work of this class. <clears throat> First, in true theological aesthetics mode, the students who have joined me on the journey of this course interacted with multiple communities behind. They queried the sacred scriptures, and especially the Gospel of Mark. They conversed with theological complexities, such as the dual nature of Jesus Christ, and they struggle with foundational faith claims, such as the resurrection. They also discovered controversies as they read Father Rausch's work and were surprised by the polarizing fights that periodically erupt within the Christian community's long life. But the communities behind the works these young people produce are not only the theological texts, although these are central. They also include other creative works, ancient and contemporary, comforting or disquieting. And I rely greatly on this part of our university as an institution, on this very fine library, and most importantly, on the Department of Archives and Special Collections to give our students intimate and sensorial encounters with works of creativity. During your tour tonight, you will see some of these works paired up with the student works. And you will notice how we have the influence of great artists like Salvador Dali or Koro Okuda and also treasures of creativity no one ever expected to be in a museum collection, such as the little humble 19th century prayer books hand-bound by women from one of the early California ranchos. Now the preservation of such products of human creativity for future generations is a key role of the university. Thus in texts and in materials, Theology and the arts are the communities that stand behind these students and their beautiful works. Second, as they worked, these students were also aware that their work was also responsible to the communities in front of the art. We came to understand the process of theologically charged, creative making as one of communicating honestly with others at the level of ultimate questions. As we read deeply into Christology, we were confronted by the difficulty of understanding each other across the chasm of time and culture. We read in text and then experienced through art the questioning, the development, and the constructive reconstructions of theological questions that a generation before had appeared as settled and now needed to be, what's the word, guys? Wrestled with? <laughs> <laughs> we, that's our word. Needed to be wrestled with anew. As these young people, engage the communities in front of the art of past generations, these generations of artists and people of faith spoke with them of their beliefs and also of their doubts and difficulties. And as we looked at contemporary works, such as the new interpretation of the creation story by Armonia Rosales, or the theological insights of Sergio Gomez and John August Swanson, we saw our own time reflected back to us, asking us new questions about liberation, about feminism, about inclusion and unconditional kinship. <clears throat> For these students, their relationship to past communities and their desire to enter into a new relationship with you, their audience, are also at the center of their efforts. You will see that their works endeavor 
to engage their acts of beauty making as an intentional process of seeking truth and proposing an inspiring goodness. Theologically, aesthetic work is never art for art's sake, but art for the sake of the common good. In this, we see the close alignment with our university's mission that orients all of our work in the world toward the flourishing of that world. And third, theological aesthetics method also acknowledges the uniqueness of the artist. As you will notice, we don't say the artist is everything. A genius working alone someplace for his own personal glory, no. The theologically aesthetic artist is a thoughtful and engaged member of a community. Our student artists, as influenced by communities behind them, and as oriented to communities in front of them, bring their own unique voice, their beautifully complex millennial sensitivities, their personal struggles, their social location as gendered, embodied, culturally expressing beings who are part of particular religious, ethnic, social, and political traditions, and who are in the process, the very important process, of exploring and forging their identities. As you will see when you explore their art, Theologizing, speaking of God through art, has made it possible for these young people to take risks. Making ourselves vulnerable and hoping against hope. Theologian Elizabeth Johnson reminds us is a necessary condition for freedom. As you tour the show, please notice how personal these works are and how much of the unique journey of each young artist shimmers through their work. Or, in theological aesthetics method, we practice a radical respect for the work of art and for it to speak in its own right. We make every effort to step back from the work, to give it room, to empty ourselves of preconceptions, to allow the art to be other to us, and to surprise us. So a relationship with a work of art opens us up to wonderment, and it really requires our humility. Many of the students here will attest to you to their own surprise at what they made. And Pope John Paul II tells us that God is the only creator, and the rest of us are craftspeople, working with the matter and the gifts that God has given us. But he also tells us that we are never closer to being in the image of God than when we are creating beauty and shining a light on humanity's path. Works of art in themselves should fill us with great wonder at the gifts of the Creator that shine through them, and that surprise even the artists. So as you take in the exhibit tonight, and hopefully come back to keep company with it several more times during this semester, Remember that you are experiencing the voices of two millennia of Christian communities that have asked similar questions. And that our own questions, as the communities in front, are urgent, they're different, they're unique, and they're renewed with every generation. These young artists have given us of themselves, taking risks become vulnerable as they ask profound theological questions. And I hope that you make yourself present and let these works surprise you. Because they will reveal 
some of the transcendence that shimmers all around us and that for a moment breaks through into our heart. Now in a bit, three of our students are going to speak to you about the theological aesthetics ways that art works. But before then, I want you to just imagine something. What if you were in this class? How would you do on your midterm? <laughs> <laughs> do you think you would do well? Well, this group of students certainly did well. And I invite you to sit back now and enjoy the midterm exam of one of our student groups. <laughs> kind of a revelation of, of the real mystery of who Jesus is. There are also moments, which is one of the things I love about Mark's Gospel, where you have a sense that he knows that Jesus is something more than just, you know, an offshoot of the house of David, a, a messianic figure. The story of him walking on the water, and Mark says, he meant to pass them by which makes no sense at all, because he's coming to see them. They're in a storm, and they're worried. You know? But you have to know the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, Yahweh is described, I'm walking, I'm, is described as walking on the waters. And in the book of uh, Job, it says, should he draw near to me, should he pass me by into a culture that's largely oral, they would hear that immediately and, and link that with, the picture of Yahweh in the Old Testament walking on the water in the book of Job. It's in the book of Job. So it's like um, Mark knows there's something more about Jesus, and he doesn't quite have the language to describe it. So he's using these Old Testament uh, images, which are, it's a theophany. You know, this is, this is God showing himself, except now it's Jesus. So uh, that fascinates me as somebody who studies Christology, because you see that he has this this uh, sense that Jesus is more than just another human being. In Johnson's book, she touches upon the deep mystery of human nature and how each of us are on a quest for the infinite. And Christology allows us to see the infinite through Jesus Christ. Christology is an inherited tradition that allows us to open up our understanding of our relationship with Christ. And in this tradition, I think art plays an especially significant role on creating a space for conversation between the artists of the work, the communities behind and in front of that work. We can also say that Christology is a living tradition, and I say living in the sense that there's a constant reimagining of who Christ is. And so throughout history, we've had successive understandings of Jesus himself, uh, whether that's remembering his genuine humanity, examining him as liberator, or exploring different feminist theologies. Johnson um, opens up the idea of the school nature um, in two kind of schools of thought that uh, divine nature is greater than any human nature. So the idea of divine nature and human nature coming together in one person in the form of Jesus Christ almost seems impossible because the divine nature will always overshadow human nature. But then the other way that she sees it is that um, Humans, God did not create humans to compete with God and to compete with divine nature, um, but rather we were made for God. And so Johnson puts forth the idea that Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. The base of liberation Christology lies in recognizing the suffering of the oppressed and coming together in faith as a movement to collectively strive for a positive change. While it first originated in Latin America, it first focused on the experiences of the systematically oppressed in third world countries, contrasting past emphasis on the perspective of white privileged European males in earlier forms of Christology. One of the great examples of liberation theology at work is the celebration of the image of the crucified Christ or images of Christ's passion. Common in communities of Latin America or countries like the Philippines this is a commonly misunderstood image, and so what's important here is the recognition of an oppressive situation, and from there we can begin to question how the situation came to be, and then relook tradition and begin to liberate. 
Recognize as a people's theology, it looks at Christology under a different light, focusing on social justice and aspects like our interpersonal engagement with others within our community. It is definitely still relevant in our society today as we deal with current events like the Black Lives Matter movement, DACA, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, and also the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar where um, they're pushed out of their homes forcefully and violently due to relig religious differences. Around the world, liberation Christology is definitely so evident as we see various oppressed groups come together to stand up for their civil rights. Liberation Christology is definitely so relevant today with the values it represents for our world. So there are many characteristics of feminist Christology. Christ can be, in, can be seen as a liberator for women, and it could be seen in the Bible that Jesus has a bear, he's a male, and it could be seen that being a male is the only way to get closer to God. And there's many implications that come from that, and one of the main issues is sexism, which is very apparent in our society today. And by better understanding feminist Christology, we can break those barriers, we can break gender roles, and fight against sexism. The Adoration of the Kings by Jean Gossard does a number of things. First, it speaks to feminist Christology. The Christ depicted here questions the traditional masculine depiction of Jesus and its effects on how we view God. Secondly, there's a significance in the reception of his gifts. There's a giving of worth to humanity. Thirdly, the vulnerability of flesh, the nakedness that Jesus takes on, becomes a reminder that he is a created being. There's a notion that Christ shares a creatureliness with all of creation. The results painting, I think, is a great example of how our understanding of God has evolved over time. And in that painting, God is depicted as a, um, an African-American grandmother. And I think that the communities depicted in the original work by Michelangelo obviously were very different than the ones depicted in Rosales' painting and clearly the the content is targeted towards a different audience and is meant to convey a different meaning and I think that's really interesting how we can sort of revisit something that holds a lot of Christological and theological significance but to use it to put something modern day into context in this case uh, civil rights and social justice in Johnson's book, there's a, I believe in chapter 9, there's a part where she talks about these two differing perspectives on the relationship between Jesus, God, and the, uh, just the suffering that humankind can feel. And between these, the two viewpoints she points to are that of these two the theologians, one of whom is called um, Moltmann. And he has this point of view that when a human being is suffering, when they're at their lowest moment, that the, uh, the God is with them in those moments to kind of ease their suffering. And he has this idea that on the cross, when Jesus died and God was, was, was there watching, he felt that same suffering, and that was kind of the key to linking together the possibility of him being there with you. I think Moltmann's perspective is depicted in the Dali painting because clearly Jesus is shown to be experiencing the crucifixion with God. He's not simply on earth fixed to the cross, experiencing that in a very human way. He's actually shown to be held kind of in the heavens. And I think that that clearly shows that, that God is holding him. And you also notice that the the crucifixion is depicted not as a bloody sort of massacre, but that Jesus' hands are actually free of nails. There's no stab wound in his side. It almost seems like God is actually trying to relieve some of that suffering. And I think it really shows that God is empathetic to that suffering. In terms of God's suffering in relation to man in general, rather than just with Christ on the cross, I think given that God is all-powerful, that he experiences all of our suffering all the time. And if we are images of God and we suffer, then one could only imagine what God must feel and what he must go through when we suffer. The other side of this argument that Moltmann makes, you have this theologian named Spilvis, 
who, instead of arguing that suffering that enters men and women is healed in a way by God, he, Skilovix more argues that God is this purely positive um, entity that is more powerful than all of the the hate and suffering and evil in the world, and that by embracing him and by entering into his sol the solidarity of that, we are ultimately saved. The Resurrection Cookum by Stanley Spencer is an art piece that exemplifies this notion of salvation for all. This piece is not an abstraction, and in much the same way that Dali reimagined typical depictions of the crucifixion, Spencer here reimagines the resurrection, and rather than placing it in some celestial sphere, puts it in the graveyard of his hometown parish. And so Christ here offers a salvation that affects all creatures. The imagery here, and really the ever-changing image of Christ, allows us as humans to remain hopeful that our little pinhole of a world that we live in could be bigger. to their own art. Um, first, we will have Daniel McGrath come up to speak about the first function. Daniel? Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel McGrath. I'm a senior electrical engineering student. And uh, I made this sculpture called Living with Christ in the Future. Um, I was inspired to make this sculpture after taking a walk one day over to the chapel um, where I noticed this statue by the chapel that shows these two parties that are kind of um, like reaching out to one another. And the figures in the statue have such sad expressions on their faces. And I realized when I was looking at that statue that, um, that the, the two groups, um, one is the people who have come before us who are in the past, and that the other group is um, those of us who are still here in the present. And so I just had this revelation about the importance of passing down tradition and how important it is to honor those who have come before us. Um, so I made this sculpture. And the purpose of this sculpture is to not to, um, I guess, uh, pass down the tradition of one aspect of Christianity, like the crucifix or the Eucharist, um, but to just kind of address the importance of passing down tradition itself. And so. In the, in the sculpture, there's a man and child who are seen uh, reading from a book, and across the river from them, there are these three cloaked figures who, um, whose only uh, distinguishable feature is just the shape of their heads. And so what I'm trying to convey with this sculpture is just that um, the passing down the tradition is really our only link to the past. And to me, um, honoring those who have come before me is so important. And for a man and child to take the time to look at the Bible or to look at a historical text and to share that together, that is where the tradition goes from the present to the future. In this case, the uh, child who's with her father, she will go on to pass down the tradition of the Bible um, or even photos of her family and her loved ones 
and the teachings that she learned from them uh, to her own children. And so um, I also uh, included a small urn there just to symbolize the, um, um, the fact that those who have come before us, we really have no link to them other than through um, tradition. Thank you. Next up to speak about the second function of art, we have Mercy Mariana. Hi, I'm Mercy Magallanes. I'm a junior computer science major. And essentially, more often than not, we know that religious art has often been the artists wrestling with tradition and their own interpretation of like, what tradition means to them. In particular, for example, David Dehan's Eche Omo is the product of Dehan's wrestling with, it, with tradition, in particular the scene in the Bible where Jesus is mocked in front of a crowd with a crown of thorns on his head. And my own art piece, Eche Joan, took inspiration from Dehan's work and Carl Theodore Dreyer's 1927 fi silent film, The Passion of Joan of Arc. The film documents the trial and death of Joan of Arc after her capture. In the film, Joan's jailer is mock her by placing a twisted crown atop her head and an arrow in her hands, mimicking uh, Eche Omo, with Joan standing in as Jesus. From there, I took this inspiration and made my own Eche Omo, which I called Eche Joan. And essentially, I wanted to mimic like a holographic card, in the sense that from one side of the panels, you see Joan as a stained glass figure with the words for France underneath her. And on the other side, you see Jesus, a even though he has less distinguishable features, you can still tell it's Jesus. From up close and from like face on, you can't really tell what the painting is. However, it requires the um, viewer to move around the painting and get like two different perspectives to really see what the painting's about. And essentially, that's my own wrestling with tradition. Because even though from what we've learned about the Bible, it's how it's very male-centric, I decided to place Joan in the figure in Jesus's position because after all their de um, their demise are very similar to each other. So, thank you. And last but not least, we have Ralph Patisil who also designed the um, the the cover for your uh, for the ads for this art show, so if you want to give them a hand for that. So good evening everyone, um, my name is Ralph and I was born and raised on the beautiful island of Guam. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, Guam is an unincorporated territory of the United States, but 300 years ago we were originally colonized by the Spanish then America, then Japan, then the U.S. recaptured Guam in World War II. And today some might still argue that Guam is a 21st century colony. We don't get to vote for the U.S. president. Uh, the U.S. military occupies 28% of our land. And we have limited say in the larger affairs that concern our island because we have a non-voting delegate in Congress. Um, in the past couple of years, escalating military and political tension in our little corner of the Pacific uh, and a growing desire to defend the culture and indigenous rights of my indigenous people, the Chamorro, have been the cause for the emergence of a decolonization movement. And while the movement promises great progress for the indigenous people, um, it has also caused great divisions. Guam is predominantly Catholic. It's a tradition that we inherit from the Spanish. And the local church is one such affected community. And so now many question their belief in the God of foreign invaders, and really the several other ideals and systems that we've inherited from all our colonizers. That being said, um, this is where I hope that my painting can serve some purpose. And so the creation of a nativity display, or in Chamorro, Belen, um, during Christmas time is a common tradition that we inherited from the Spanish. And here I've indigenized the scene, uh, a Spanish conquistador and fittingly a Jesuit priest and a native chief bear gifts before an indigenous child, Jesus, and his mother. And beside them are uh, two women, uh, representative of the Chamorro matrilineal culture, 
and in the background, faces of those who have died look down in admiration, a nod to ancient Chamorro ancestor worship. By indigenizing the scene, I had hoped that this painting would serve to help my community see the beauty in their own culture and to see the strength in their long history of suffering and to see the good where they didn't before. And in seeing the good, I hope that they can heal. And as an artist, I've always tried to, I've always tried to find the beauty in all things, but you don't need to be an artist to find beauty. Um, and my friends have heard me say this like a million times before, but I, I'd like to invite you now to all play pretend with me for a little bit. Um, and it might help to close your eyes just so you can kind of picture things. My favorite feeling in the world is when I'm back home on a beach at sunset. And in, so, instead of lying on the sand, I like to lie in warm water that's just shallow enough to cover my ears so that the only thing I hear are the waves. And while I'm looking straight up at the sky, I wait for it to change colors from blue to orange to purple and then to black. And as soon as that happens, the whites of the stars begin to peek out. And all of this just happens in a couple of minutes. And you can open your eyes. And in that moment, I see art. I see some form of beauty. And beauty, in turn, uh, goodness, fosters in us a sense of wonder and transcendence the infiniteness of our human experience. And so I'd like to encourage everyone here today to continue to find beauty in all things. And I think it's not just, it's a lot cliche to say, but more often than not, you'll find the most beautiful things in the most unexpected places, in the grotesque, in the broken, in the ugly. And so I encourage you all to constantly look because our world is filled with so much hidden beauty and so much hidden potential for goodness. Dankaluna Sidus Maasi, or in English, thank you. <laughs> so now you know why I'm crazy about these kids. <laughs> you guys just... Um, Emily was sitting there kind of bursting. <laughs> so proud. And, and I certainly am so proud of you. Um, so what uh, we want to do uh, now is to really um, go and have an experience with the art. But before we do that, I want to call on John Jackson, who will do a little bit of an announcement. Hello everyone, um, on your seats you'll notice there were some feedback forms. Um, before you leave tonight, if you could do us a huge favor and let us know what you thought of the event and uh, please tell us um, where you're from and if you have any ideas uh, for future events, we'd love to know them, but we really just want to know um, if you enjoyed tonight and uh, if you'd like to see more of this in the future. Um, so you can always drop that off with me. I think I'm the only person in the room wearing a bow tie, so it should be easy to find. Um, or you can drop them off in the box at the front at any point during the evening. So, thank you. And before, um, before we go out into our great party and exhibition, I do want to acknowledge two people uh, who finally is here. Jonathan Swanson, will you please stand, John? acquired some of Mr. Swanson's amazing works and we are putting them in the uh, uh, classroom so that you can see them. They, they, we just got them so they're not framed or anything so we're very excited about that. And then Tony Amodeo, yes. you are here. And please sit. <laughs> from the library uh, as our uh, reference librarian for theological studies. But for years, for years, he worked with our students. And not only that, he worked with me when I was a graduate student. <laughs> so I am grateful that you are here, Tony. Thank you for coming. And so now we go out into the room. But first, Cynthia Garcia, where are you? There she is. So Cynthia Garcia 
our amazing and wonderful student who works in the archives will be in the classroom where there will be some of the precious things and she will be there to help you with that and to tell you what you may touch and what you may not touch. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Cynthia will lead us out and then will the rest of our beautiful student docents please stand. <laughs> students will be throughout the gallery and, and the atrium ready to talk with you about what uh, they have uh, done and about the work that some of their uh, classmates have done. So um, we have a couple of minutes for questions before we head out because they're getting things ready. So if there's anyone that would like to question or comment, we would be happy to take it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, let's just say, how amazing is that? <laughs> okay? Uh, and uh, Ralph is graduating this, uh, this year, and uh, we, uh, we've just been so blessed to have him in the class. And uh, he, he did an amazing job, not, on, not only as you saw as an artist, but really to show us what a true artist theologian is. Um, and he was so generous with his classmates as we put the show together. So I want to say a special thank you to Ralph. Okay, well then, let's head out and please find the students with their buttons. And if you don't have a button yet, come see me so you can get your button. <laughs> and, and let's have fun. Oh, I got into this. Where is it?